My name is Monk Rowe, and we're filming today for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. I'm pleased to have John Eric Kelso, trumpeter and jazz musician, with us today. So let's be honest, what's a nice young man like you doing playing jazz music? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, uh, I, I got interested when I was really young. My, my parents were both into the swing era music. You know, they, they grew up during that time, and they had a lot of good old records around the house. So right. when I was about 10 years old, I, I got interested in playing the trumpet. And then after I decided to play trumpet, I found out that my father was a trumpet player and, and had played you know, in some swing bands and during the World War II days, you know, and uh, found some of his old records around and got, got interested in it. Did you pick the trumpet then without him kind of pushing you into exactly. it? Exactly. I had no, I didn't even know that he had played trumpet, so oh, I had a built-in first trumpet teacher there. He was, uh -huh. a, you know, and he hadn't played in years, but it was kind of amazing. He was able to pick up the, his old horn, which he still had, and uh, play, you know, pretty well, considering how many years it had been yeah. since he had touched it. But it sort of sounded a little bit like Harry James, and, uh -huh. and that was my it's, first It's not a bad idol. guy to sound like. Yeah, yeah, that was his big idol, and that was uh -huh. my first, first trumpet idol, because those were the records that he had. Well, it's perhaps fortunate he didn't try to push you into it because, you know, kids, he might have rebelled or something, and yeah, it's a nice I, coincidence you picked it on your own. Right, yeah, it worked out quite well. <laughs> Did I, he I, talk about what those um, experiences were like? with you playing with the big bands? Well, he, yes, he did. He, he never really got too far with it. I mean, he mm -hmm. played in just really when he was a kind of a teenager is when he did most yeah. of his playing. And, uh, and he, he picked it up and, and started playing some gigs around Detroit, which is, I'm from near Detroit. Mm -hmm. And uh, he played with some German bands and some swing combos and big bands. and, and uh, he, he talked about it, but he said he never really had the chops to really make it as a, as a professional. He just right. was close, but no cigar, but he loved, always loved the music. And uh -huh. after World War II, he gave up playing just to go into other professions, real estate and different things like that. Yeah. Well, you had a pretty good, I um, read a little bit about uh, your school experience. Mm -hmm. You got in a youth orchestra, something like that. Yeah, I, I started pretty quick. I mean, I really... Early on, I really took to playing the trumpet right away. I loved it, and I just, you know, I was one of those kids that my parents had to tell me to stop practicing instead of, you know, <laughs> trying to force me to practice, you know. And uh, so I, I progressed pretty rapid, rapidly. I practiced a lot, and uh, I, I played in, uh, I was like when I was in elementary school, I, I would sneak over and play with the junior high band, or they would actually, they'd ask me to come over yeah. and play with them to help out. And when I was in junior high, I'd go and play with the high school band. When I was in high school, I was playing with a college band, you know. You were a ringer. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> you know, and and they, I had good teachers who, who knew that that was a good thing for me to push me, you know, as far as uh, testing my limits and putting me in more challenging territory. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess I was in seventh grade when. Uh, friend of mine, Mike Karub, who's a cello player and bass player. His father was the junior high band director where I grew up. And uh, his father had put him, gotten him into this group called the International Youth Symphony, which was basically, I was about the youngest guy, and it was like junior high through college age mm -hmm. people in, in mostly the Detroit and Windsor areas. And so I started playing in seventh grade in this group, the International Youth Symphony, which was a good youth symphony, very good. And the, the conductor of the Windsor Symphony, Maddie Holly, was the conductor for that. And uh, that was quite a challenge because I hadn't played any orchestral music yet at all, seventh grade, you know. Right. And all of a sudden they're talking about transposing, reading, you know, A trumpet parts and C trumpet parts and E flat trumpet parts. And I wasn't even, had never even heard of that yet. So I basically had to learn a lot real quick, <laughs> and wow. I, I did well. I, I, th I always thrived on challenges like that. Hmm. I didn't know that that was still required in, from trumpets, that yeah. they, they do that kind of thing. Yeah, the orchestral, it's, it's standard. And actually, the standard trumpet that they use in orchestras is a C trumpet, which is uh, oh. it pitched differently than yeah. the, the standard band and jazz mm -hmm. band trumpet, yeah. which is in B flat. So. Yeah, almost everything was transposing, and that, so, well, so that was a good experience. And uh, how did you get into the improvising end of things? Well, I got interested in that pretty early because uh, 
like I said, I started playing when I was 10, and right around the same time, I, I was getting interested in my parents' old records. And, uh, and you know, I'd ask my dad about what, what's going on, what is this? You know, I wanted to know more about what was happening, and he'd explain to me when things were written out and when things were just guys taking a ride, as he liked to call it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I got interested in that, and uh, my friend Mike Karub and I, like I said, we were pals and interest, getting interested in this music at the same time. He was always like one step ahead of me, like, because uh, his father was a band director. His, his father was, would say, hey, well, you should listen to this record. And then he'd, he'd call me up and say, I've got this record I think you might like. It's a guy named Louis Armstrong, you know? <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's a little bit older than the stuff you've been listening to. Uh -huh. I think you like, you'd like that, you know? And so we'd get together and li listen to these records, and our parents would sort of give us a little steering in the right direction as far as telling us what was going on. And, Excellent. It was fascinating, you know. Can you recall what uh, Louis Armstrong you first heard? Which part of his career? Hot Fives, yeah. Well, that's so, a good place to start. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I have to admit, when I first heard it, I kind of didn't know what to make of it because I was so, I was really the only stuff I was familiar with at that point, you know, being fifth grade, you know, <laughs> was uh, in. Benny Goodman and, and Harry James and Count Basie, and which which I love that stuff. And to, he, to hear this, at first I hadn't heard anything that old at all of anything, and so the the surface noise it had kind of a bad LP copy of it. It was like it was a little bit of work to listen to, but I knew it, it was hitting me hard though. I mean, I knew mm -hmm. that this music was very powerful and great, and that you know he was a great player, of mm -hmm. course, you know. But I just. It took me a while to really start getting into listening to music from that early on because I was sort of just, it was a, it was a little bit harder to listen to for me at that time because of the, the surface noise and all that. Yeah, it's hard to get past that kind of the limited technology that, was, that mm -hmm. they were using at that time, but it still sounds funny to hear you say that being in fifth grade, I was only familiar with Benny Goodman. <laughs> I know, I, I know. It kind of probably sounds funny. Not too many fifth graders these days, uh, or even in when I was right. in fifth grade, were really interested in that. We were considered pretty weird by our classmates for for this being interested. This was, in let's see, sixty nine or seventy. No, when, I, I was born in sixty four. Okay. So, I guess ten years old, seventy four. Oh, you know, that, okay. So I'm trying to think what, what the pop music. At the time, might have been oh, like Elton could John have influenced and, you. Oh, that influenced me. I mean, or that well, I mean, did you get into pop music also? I mean, to an extent, yeah. I, I mean, I wasn't a total jazz nerd, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there was there was. Uh, I, I liked some of the Motown stuff because my sister uh, was a bit older than me and had a lot of Motown records around the house, mm -hmm. and so and some oldies rock we had around yeah. the house, you know, like stuff. Again, it's stuff that was before my time, but that was some of the things that I was interested in as far as pop music. What about, um, did you happen to get into groups like Chicago or BS and T that had yeah, horn I, sections? I did like those. Yeah, I've yeah. always I've always enjoyed those kind of groups yeah. too. You know, it's fun music. You know, good, they always had good horn players. And but you were still a jazzer from. Yeah, I mean that age. was the thing I was most interested in. But I, I've always been pretty open-minded and mm -hmm. listened to. A lot of different things, from classical to some pop to whatever, you know. Uh, what about college experience? Did you continue your your love of jazz through college? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, for, like I said, when I was in high school, I was playing with this, getting some summer credits in this program called the Henry Ford Community College Jazz Program, mm -hmm. which was directed by a guy named Jack Pearson, who was a great teacher and a good influence. And uh, we, we used to play at the Montreux Detroit Jazz Festival every summer and with that group. And I got to meet a lot of great players there and had some good teachers. And so that's sort of my beginning of my college jazz training there. And then uh, I, I went into Wayne State University in Detroit after I graduated from Allen Park High School. And I, was, uh, I started off being a jazz studies major. Matt Michaels, this great piano player, teacher there, was, was uh, directing the band. And it was a good experience, too. I, I got to go to Europe with that band and uh, wow. you know, met a lot more good players. And I, I went to school on and off for about six years at Wayne State, played in the band, and again, played at the Montreux Jazz Festival and did other types of concerts with that group. It was, uh -huh. it was good. I enjoyed that. 
What was happening with your personal taste as far as the kinds of jazz you were listening to? Good question. <laughs> I've been through a lot of phases, I guess yeah. you could say. You know, like my first listening experiences were the swing era, then I started sort of going backwards from there and learning about listening to Bix Beiderbecke and Louis Armstrong and, and also then getting into like the Eddie Condon groups with Bobby Hackett and Wild Bill Davison. And then uh, I kind of proceeded, I sort of jumped a little bit and then I, then I, my dad had one Miles Davis record and I listened to that, you know, and, and I thought, wow, this is just a completely different way to play the trumpet, but I liked that too, you know, so I, so then I started buying all kinds of Miles Davis records and from that I learned about Charlie Parker and then from that, you know, I just, one thing would lead to another, you buy one record looking at, looking for one particular guy and then somebody else on that record, you know, opens your eyes and you say, well, now I got to get this guy's records. And so, yeah. so I've, I, I went through, uh, in high school, I started to go through a period where I was buying a lot of bebop records. I like that too. And started to play a little bit of the, you know, with groups kind of trying to play that kind of style. And, uh -huh. uh, and of course the college jazz programs generally aren't really geared towards the older styles of music. They're generally be up, bebop and beyond, you know, and, right. and, and, you know, but I was interested in that and I was very open-minded and I wanted to know as much about every kind of jazz as, as I could, really, and that's why I was playing in groups that were playing even like uh, Brecker Brothers stuff in college, and you know, fusion, and I, you know, I went through these different periods wow. where I would tr really try to give everything a shot and learn what I could from it. And it's funny now, after going through all these different phases, I find myself sort of back to where I started, you know, with playing yes. mostly music from the swing era, give or take, you know, a little bit. Some traditional jazz, mm -hmm. Dixieland, whatever you want to call it, and swing music, small group swing. Is this market um, for, I don't know what to call it, mainstream, I guess? I mean, what you're going to be playing tonight, mm -hmm. is that a decent word for it? Yeah, it's as good as any. I'm, I'm right. you know, I'm not uh, classic. I don't yeah. know what to call either. Yeah, there's but, there's a lot of different names for it. I don't really you know mind any of the, the yeah. titles for it. It's basically, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, based on tunes from the 30s and 40s. Yeah, even a lot from the 20s too. A lot of people a lot of people think of some songs as being from the 40s when they were really written in the oh. 20s or even the teens sometimes. Wow. You know. <laughs> And how did you go about, um, was there a method to trying to memorize and learn these tunes? Because I'm always interested in how all these people fly in from different parts of the country mm -hmm. and uh, this promoter hopefully puts them together in workable right. ensembles. Right. <laughs> and then you get up there and the, the designated leader says, okay, here's the tune, let's go. Right, yeah, sometimes you talk it over beforehand, sometimes uh -huh. you don't, sometimes you're just on the stand and you better know the song they call or else you're, you're gonna be embarrassed or, or you're gonna be scuffling a little bit. Yeah. And for the trumpet player, it's, it's a little bit more pressure than the other guys in the band because the trumpet player is generally expected to play the melody. <laughs> At least so, so they can recognize it, you know? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, I mean, if you're the clarinet player in a front line playing, you know, sort of ensemble, freewheeling kind of playing, if you've got good ears, you can hear the chord mm -hmm. changes. Even if you've never heard the song before, you can generally, you've got the first chorus to listen to the rhythm section, the trumpet player, and sort of fill in. And you can get away with something. I mean, not to put down any of the other members in the band, but it is a little bit of an extra pressure. You better, you have to know the songs, you know. And so I, I kind of learned under uh, interesting circumstances because, uh, you know, starting out as young as I did, uh, I, my first big job, major uh, steady gig, was playing at a place called Greenfield Village in uh, Dearborn, Michigan, which is where the Henry Ford Museum is. And my friend Mike Karub, who I mentioned before, uh, he always had a lot of chutzpah, you know, and he, <laughs> aside from being a great player, and he, he was very ambitious, maybe the better word for it, mm -hmm. but uh, he, he decided, we, we had started playing around at PTA meetings, playing Dixieland arrangements uh -huh. that his father would help us dig up and swing band stuff, big band stuff. We actually had a big band when I was in fifth grade and he was in sixth grade. Wow. Playing, you know, big band classics. And uh, we decided it was easier to have like a six piece group because there was, 
six guys, who, six people who could improvise. You know, the rest were just sort of like scuffling along, yeah. you know. No one's mother would let them come to rehearsal. It was hard. <laughs> a big band is always a hard thing to schedule and, and keep together. It's, it's a lot of, uh, you know, logistics involved. Six people was a little less complicated, yeah. and we could also, we just were gravitating towards that kind of music yeah. anyway. So we, he decided he'd call up Greenfield Village and, and uh, because it was kind of like this sort of trip back into time sort of place, you know. And I uh, said, well, what you need there is a, is a Dixieland band, you know, to play outside and down by the river there. They had a gazebo and, and they said, hmm, that's an interesting idea. So why don't you come in and audition? So, so we went in and auditioned and played like the six songs that we knew or whatever it was, you know, at that point. And, uh, and it went well and they hired us and they said, great, you're going to be playing uh, six days a week, five hours a day for the summer. And you were how old? I was... Uh, I'm trying to remember. I was either going into seventh grade, no, going into eighth grade, I think. <laughs> yeah, somewhere between seventh and eighth grade, I think. And uh, so all of a sudden, here we are playing five hours a day, six days a week, and we got pretty tired of this, those, well, it might have been a dozen songs or something yeah, that we knew by yeah. heart, and then we had some arrangements. but. So we just started finding ways, whatever we could, to buy arrangements of old tunes that we liked. and. Uh, and also just learn things from records and mm -hmm. lead sheets and sheet music and we just sort of helped each other through it and learned a lot of songs in a hurry, you know, mostly just to keep ourselves from going crazy and playing the same songs all the time. Did you get any press from that? I would imagine that, you know, yeah, we did. a young group of kids in there. Yeah, yeah, and we also started to get more, get to know more of the musicians around town because we even then we'd have to sub out some dates because, you know, whatever, so-and-so would have a football game or a baseball game or, so, or, or whatever, a family uh, uh -huh. you know, commitment or something like that. So, so we started to get to know some of the better older players around town because didn't, you know, there wasn't anything in our contract that it had to be kids playing. So, I mean, they liked that. I think it was, a, it was one of the selling points. Right. But uh, anyway, so we, yeah, we got to know a lot of the players around Detroit. And there was quite a few and still, is, still are quite a few good players of all different styles there. It's always been a good music city, you know. That's a great story. You're, you're kind of used to hearing that kind of story from from the guys that grew up in the 20s and 30s. You know, it was it just seemed to fit those times more. Yeah, sometimes but, I think we were born in the wrong era, you know. Well, you should say that. <laughs> I felt that way myself, yeah. <laughs> um, today, in, in the market, being a, a jazz musician, Mm -hmm. Is it a? I want to get too personal. Is it a decent way to make a living? Is it? Is it hard? It's yeah. I'd, I'd have to say it is. It is not an easy way to to make a living. It's. Uh, but it, again, on the other hand, it's it's. I'm really happy and fortunate and pleased to be doing what I've always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I make a living. I, I do okay. It's, yeah. it's, Let's say this: It's not an easy way to get rich. I mean, that's it's, you know, I, I didn't get into music to become, you know, rich. So, right. but I do okay. I've always I've always managed to be able to be a, a full time musician and pay my bills and and uh, you know I do I do okay. Mm -hmm. But it's it, there's only a select few really that do you know that are able to do that compared to the musicians that just decide well okay I'll just do this on the side and have a a day gig as they say you know so. Do you augment the these kind of gigs with um, anything like pit bands or playing theater shows, that kind of thing? Not so much uh, theater and pit bands. Like, yeah, I do live in New York, so you'd think maybe I was doing Broadway, but that's that's kind of a very specific kind of playing that I'm not as interested in and mm -hmm. not really as cut out for that. Although I, you know, I read and everything. That's not the yeah. problem. It's just. I don't think I would enjoy it mostly, <laughs> but uh, I do. I have always done all different kinds of gigs, and that I'll do private parties, which could mean weddings or anniversary parties or uh, things like that, mm -hmm. uh, dances and and uh, oh, any number of things. I mean, you know, all kinds of little industrial events. Sometimes they'll hire a oh, band right. to play, and uh, you know, all different kinds of things like that. And I have played like shows behind. Uh, singers and groups. Back when I lived in Detroit, I used to play in, in bands. They, the Motown groups would come through town and use local horn sections. They'd have their rhythm section that they'd travel with and they'd hire 
local horn horn mm -hmm. players, and that was fun. You know, I got to right. play with, uh, you know, the Temptations and the Four Tops and uh, Martha Reeves and the OJ's and groups right. like that. You know, and that was fun. They were all really, always very professional, nice guys, mm -hmm. and they. I think they really appreciated the Detroit horn sections because most of us had grown up with that music and we, oh, yeah. and we knew how it was supposed to go. They didn't have to go through and rehearse too long with us, you know, and it was always good Looks players. Looks good on your resume, too. Huh? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I played with the Temptations, you know, <laughs> except the people at this at a party like this, an uh, event like this, probably wouldn't be as excited about that <laughs> as the younger folks. They'd say, what is this, rock and roll, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I've always done kind of a, a variety of gigs, and mm -hmm. I, that's one of the things I like about being a musician is that it's, I'm not always playing with the same people and with, at the same uh -huh. kind of place, and I, I kind of like the challenge of doing a variety right. of kinds of music. Have you been able to uh, kind of play alongside some of your influences or heroes? Yeah, that's a that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, I, I was very fortunate. I mean, aside from meeting the the local heroes around Detroit and playing with some of them, uh, which were probably mostly names you might not know, but you know, was a thrill. Every year I'd get to play with better and better uh -huh. musicians. Uh, one of the first ones I got to play with, uh, there's a guy named Tom Saunders in Detroit, who's a very great cornet player and. Uh, I used to go and hear him when I wasn't even really old enough to be in the bars that he was playing in, but uh, we'd go and hear him, and he, he introduced me to Wild Bill Davison. He was sort of a protege friend of Wild Bill's, and he used to bring in Wild Bill to this club that he played in in Detroit, Detroit area uh, whenever he could. And sometimes he'd have him in town for a week or two weeks or something like that, or just one concert. And so uh, he put on a concert called Three, Four Generations of Jazz Cornet, and I was the young generation. There was a guy from Boston called Paul, uh, named Paul Monnet, Paul Monnet, who was maybe in his 30s at the time. And then Tom was in his 40s, maybe 50s mm -hmm. at the time. And then Wild Bill, who was, I don't remember how old he was at mm -hmm. the time, you know, pushing 80, I suppose. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, but uh, you know, that was when I was about 17 or 18, I think, when we did that. So that was a thrill. Got to meet Wild Bill, who was one of my favorites at the time, and still is. And uh, let's see, I've played, got to play with Doc Cheatham a couple mm -hmm. times, and that was exciting. We had a group in Detroit called the New McKinney's Cotton Pickers, which was based uh -huh. on the original McKinney's Cotton Pickers, which was a Detroit group oh, way, beautiful. way, way back, and and uh, which had included uh, Doc Cheatham and and Benny Carter and all kinds of great players. And so uh, we put on this concert. This was, a, this was one of the greatest days of my life. It was at Detroit's Orchestra Hall, which is, some say the acoustics are better than Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was playing in two different groups that were the two featured groups on this concert. So it was the new McKinney's Cotton Pickers featuring Doc Cheatham, which was a wow. thrill. And then I was in this group, uh, J.C. Hurd's big band. And he, of course, J.C. Hurd was one of the great jazz drummers, and he settled in Detroit. I had a very good big band that I play with, and he, he and Dizzy Gillespie shared the same birthday, same year, and they were friends from way, way back. And so, uh, the idea was to have the two of them celebrate their birthday together in this concert. And uh, this was the other half of this concert. I got to meet two of, play with two of my all-time idols, uh -huh. you know. And uh, so, the the sad part of it was J.C. Heard passed away the night before the concert which was a shock. He was going to be 72, I believe, and uh, he was, we had played with him two nights before, and he was in great shape and full of energy and playing great, no signs of any health problems. He just all of a sudden had a heart attack, and that was mm -hmm. it. And uh, I'll never forget how well Dizzy Gillespie handled this. And he, uh, we did the concert with one of JC's protégés, a guy named Billy Cairo, drummer in Detroit. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Dizzy managed to pay tribute to JC, his old friend, really nicely, and, but also make it a happy thing and remember the good times and tell some funny stories and just made people feel good, mm -hmm. you know, instead of it being like this whole downer, downer you know. So that was, a, that was a real exciting thing for me. He certainly had that knack of making people feel good. Yeah. <laughs> And also, the other thing that was exciting about that was uh, we were playing mostly Dizzy's, or maybe entirely, Dizzy's arrangements, his old big band arrangements. Wow. And we had an extensive rehearsal with him, and uh, 
you know, having him show us how his, these compositions were meant to be played was really enlightening and, mm -hmm. and fun, you know. But he was serious about it. He, you know, he could joke around a lot, but he was serious about the music, you know. And he was especially hard on the drummer, I'll say. He was a good drummer, but he's, you know, there was a lot of stuff that you don't write into the chart that uh -huh. you just, you have to know. <laughs> and he, was, he could be very specific. He knew a lot about drumming. Yeah. And also, you know, right. he was going to be filling some big shoes, stepping in for mm -hmm. J.C. Oh. Hurd. So he wanted to make sure that uh, this guy did, did a good job. And he did. Seems like I read somewhere that he even taught Art Blakey to play drums or something like that. I wouldn't I doubt that sure he at least cool. at least had some things to share with him to yeah. you know help him because he was he was one of the first guys into the you know Afro Cuban mm -hmm. influence on jazz and yeah. combining those things together and he I think he taught a lot of people stuff about that. Uh -huh. you know? You're probably familiar with what they said about you, but I wanted to get your opinion on it. Said. Uh, <laughs> Regarding this particular tune, he says, Kelso tips his horn just a bit in Bix Beck's direction. There are also occasional nods towards Billy Butterfield's lyrical constructions and Wild Bill Davison's ruminating low notes. Did you know you were doing all that? Well, it wasn't entirely <laughs> conscious, but that's, I have to say that's, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, honored that he said those uh -huh. nice things. I think, you know, those are certainly some of the people that influenced me right. a lot, and especially when when playing this kind of music, you know, in that kind of setting. Yeah. So uh, yeah, he was on the ball. Who, who was that? Was that I'm Floyd Levin? I'm glad to hear you say that because sometimes you, um, <laughs> Floyd Levin, yeah. Yeah, he's a good writer, good yeah. guy. But yeah. Sometimes you wonder um, when you read things that the critics or record reviewers write uh, if the musicians really agree with it. You know. Yeah, it's. When, Sometimes they're right on and they, you know, they see things as musicians do or close to it or they mm -hmm. can describe things in a very good way, which is a hard thing to do. Putting, you know, describing music with words has always been a challenging thing. So I, I have I to give these guys some credit and give them a little leeway. But yeah, there's times when they, they come up with stuff and it's like, what is, is he listening to the same thing that I'm listening uh -huh. to? Or they read a lot into things sometimes. And, but you know, he, he's one of the good ones. And uh, yeah, that's, I'm honored that he'd say those things about me. Well, I like the, the fact that you, um, on your little breaks that you had in there, that you didn't choose to just fill them with a million notes <laughs> like sometimes young, younger players do or right. That's what Cale Collins told me this morning. Uh -huh. He said, <laughs> "Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I I like to play a more kind of a lean style, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, just try and make the notes count a little bit more. You know, the uh -huh. ones that I play. I've never been much much of a player for trying to play a zillion notes, you know. And I think especially mm -hmm. in the the older styles or whatever you want to call it, swing or or." traditional jazz, it's, l it's less appropriate anyway, you know. It just doesn't sound right when the trumpet player is playing a zillion notes, and especially when you're playing in the ensembles and the lead, playing the lead the melody. Mm -hmm. It's really, uh, you know, I learned early on from some of the older guys beating it into me, you know, yeah. so, saying, you know, if you're going to be playing during the ensembles, you're playing the trumpet, play the trumpet part, and don't, don't play all the fills, you know, there's two or three other horn players around you who are, have their roles to do. And so if you can just play a nice, simple, tasteful melody that leaves, leaves holes, leaves space, that's, that's one of the best early lessons I learned from the guys around Detroit. And I try to remember that, you know. Right. That's Good what advice. makes it work. You know, everybody has to do their part and leave room for the other guys to do their part. <laughs> so something I try to think about. Yeah, you have to think about the context that you're in. Mm -hmm. This particular album had um, was more arranged than mm -hmm. some of the. Well, here we go with words again. Yeah, right. <laughs> classic whatever I've heard in. Mm -hmm. um, was he Rick Fay's arrangements or? No, Rick Fay's the the leader on this. Um, yeah. it's, it's called "This Is Where I Came In." Yeah. right on Arbors yeah. Records. Yeah. Uh, Dan Barrett was on that. I think that was that was Dan Barrett's arrangement, which was. Uh, Taken largely from the Bix, one of Bix Beiderbecke's versions of that uh -huh. song, and uh, he did a lot of arrangements on that album. I think Marty Gross did some, yeah, Marty Gross did do some arrangements on that album as well. A lot of those guys are here: Marty Gross, yeah. Dan Barrett, Great. Al Smith is here. Uh, <laughs> Tell me, were you nervous? A little that? bit, yeah, yeah. yeah that was 
in a, in, in a way, it was really my second recording session. Mm -hmm. The other one came out later, so I say that oh, this is my first I see. CD because it came out came first. Out. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, I was playing with all these these top guys there. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, was, everybody on that album was, was tops. You know, and, and uh, I was relatively new to playing with guys of that caliber. Mm -hmm. You know, after moving to New York, I started meeting guys like Dan Barrett, who introduced me to some of these other guys. And, it was a thrill. It was exciting, and you know, and I was more uptight then about like wanting everything to be perfect, you know, and, and worrying about it more than I do now after having done several recordings. You, you realize if you worry too much about that, you can drive yourself crazy. Right. And then I'd hear the tapes back, and I'd get down on myself for everything that uh -huh. wasn't exactly the way I intended it to be. Now, now I listen back to it, and I think, you know, I don't. I forgot what I intended to play. So you know, if it came out okay. Fine, you know. <laughs> That's jazz, I guess. Right, you know, I, not that it's, it's not as important to me that it comes out right, but I just used to really drive myself crazy mm -hmm. about it. You've got two, at least two, under your own name now. Right. One nice. almost brand new. Mm -hmm. And uh, on your first album, you had Milt Hinton. Yeah, I sure did. It must have been a, a good experience. Oh, boy. Yeah, he was, well, he was the highlight of that session to me, which was full of... Uh, you know, great musical moments and playing with great guys. They're all, again, they're all top-notch guys. And yeah, Matt Dahmer of Arbor's Records was great because he, he asked me to do this CD after having done a few as a sideman for him. And uh, of course, that was a great thrill and honor. But it also, he really left it in my hands to pick the guys and the tunes and the studio and the engineer. And so I really got to do it my own way and write some original tunes and mm -hmm. arrangements. and. Uh, as I was considering who to hire for this, this record, I started thinking of uh, guys, and of course you want to play with guys that you feel comfortable with, and guys that are the best guys available, and guys that you think will sound good together. And uh, I was thinking about bass players, and I thought, well, why, why not just start at the top? You know, and the worst thing he can say is no, right? You know, uh -huh. uh, so I thought, well, who's the best bass player I've played with? Or, you know, and I had done a, maybe, half dozen gigs with Milt Hinton. I thought, well, you can't really beat him, you know? And so I, I called him up and he was he was really nice about it. And, you know, because I think it was like the, the pay was probably less than he's used to because he had been used to playing on bigger labels and stuff like yeah. that. So I think he made an exception because he's always liked to help out and encourage younger players who he felt mm -hmm. were on the right track or, you know, trying to keep the music going and all that. And so. So he did it, and I was thrilled. <laughs> and he was a great, great help and a great inspiration mm -hmm. in the studio. And that, uh, you know, there was times when I, I would start to count off a tune. I think, wait a second, I should ask Milt to count this tune off. You know, because he was on like the original recording <laughs> of it. You know, and has yeah. played it with all the best bands in uh -huh. history. You know, and like, if anybody knows what tempo this should be, it's going to be him. And so, you know, so that was a nice thing to have, be able to sort of fall back on him and use his experience and try to, you know, uh, just take advantage of him in the best way possible yeah. as far as, you know, just, <laughs> you know, using his inspiration. And he was, he was such a, uh, he had such a good feeling and warmth about him in the studio. He kept everybody at ease. You'd think playing with him would have you terrified or something, but he has a way of putting you at ease and just making things feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, he'd tell some little stories when he'd have a little break and, and you know, some of that Matt captured on video too. That's, that should be in some archives too. I guess it's in Matt's archives, but that's uh -huh. that's pretty neat. I've got a copy of that. And uh, let's see. Oh, there, and the other thing is funny. You know, he was the oldest guy in the band by far. I, I don't recall. He might have been 80 at the time, or 79, or something like that. But. Uh, he also seemed to have the most energy. You know, it was amazing. You know, he was in great shape and just playing at the top of yeah. his form. And uh, he, uh, there was times when I thought, you know, I, want, I was very concerned about making sure he was comfortable and that we weren't overworking him. Right. And, you know, and I, so I, there was times when I would just kind of look around and, you know, act like I was talking to the whole band when really I was thinking of him. I'd say, well, maybe it's time we should take uh -huh. a break now. You know, I didn't yeah. want anybody to feel overworked. And but he knew when we should keep going, like let's say the, the band was starting to get a groove going mm -hmm. and, and there was nice energy and uh, you know there's times like that where you, people like him know that okay let's just knock another song out right away because he knew that we were all 
had this groove going and that we could do that. And you know, he was always right because usually when he'd say that, he'd, we'd knock some song off in one take because mm -hmm. everybody was just had this momentum going. And you know, so he was great that way. That's terrific. He's a real treasure. Oh, I'll say, yeah. I was very thrilled to have yeah. him there. How long did you have to do these records? They give you. A day or two, or two, yeah, two sessions. Uh, uh -huh. That was called Chapter One. We did that in two, I guess there were five-hour sessions, maybe six hours. Uh -huh. One of them, yeah, and then uh, the second one is called Chapter Two. Mm -hmm. Surprise, surprise, and uh, <laughs> the plot thickened. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, it was yeah about the same. I think maybe two six-hour sessions, two afternoons. And, uh, well, good for you. Yeah, I was uh, very uh, thrilled with the results of those because it's always kind of a calculated risk uh, when you're doing, well, what I did was I took a lot of friends and favorite musicians of mine who didn't necessarily all know each other or even have played with together, and I just, I could hear it in my head that these guys would sound mm -hmm. good together, and it, it worked in both cases, and, you know, it doesn't always work. You know, you might have a, an all-star band and, it, you know, they don't always click, but in these cases, they really, I felt good about it. Was it an added um, concern that the tunes of your own that you brought to the session would be accepted like, oh yeah, nice tune? Oh you yeah, know? I mean, that's, that's, a, in, uh, that's another thing where in, in both cases, on both of those albums, uh, I brought in these songs, and they had never, I had never heard them perfor performed. We had no rehearsals, you know, as a band. Just the guys are flying in from different places, or guys who just didn't know each other were too busy to get together to rehearse. So we get into the studio, and I'd sort of, a lot of times I'd save those for the end because I thought, well, you know, if we have time, we'll try this out and see if it sounds right. If the guys, if it just feels right, we'll go ahead with them. So. That's what I did. I had uh, two originals on the first album and uh, one on the second. Mm -hmm. And I was pleasantly surprised that they, they sounded like I thought they would sound. And, and even better, really, because the guys were so good, they knew how to just instantly take this, this lead sheet and, or, or arrangement and make it into music instead of just reading a bunch of notes. They knew how to, they read wow. into it and added their own experience to it. You know. I've heard that uh, some, some record people that that is a little bit of a risk to put a lot of original stuff because sometimes people pick it up and they buy it because they see sure. the tunes they know. Yeah, I mean, even I even do that sometimes. You yeah. know, there's 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 times when I look at an album and I see all these these original songs that I've never heard of, and uh, sometimes I might opt for the one that has some songs that I. I know or songs that I want to know. A lot of times I'll oh. buy CDs because I want to learn a song sometimes and I'll look for a classic version of it. So I can kind of understand that, but at the same time it's nice to to hear originals and you know keep that kind of spirit going in right. jazz too. So. Someone's got to write the tunes that will be the standards in exactly. you know, 20, 30 years from now. Yeah, so I, there's got to be a balance there somehow. Right. Yeah. So yeah. It's, I, I just put a couple in there, so I don't think people mind too much. If they don't like those tracks, they can always can just skip to, yeah, skip to the next. They can next. program the CD. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your take on the racial atmosphere in today's jazz scene? Hmm. Well, is, is there one that, that is uh, prevalent or, or not? Well, yeah, it's it's kind of a a strange subject because I think there's a lot of sort of cliques, and it's I don't think it's always necessarily that the guys don't want to play together as far as blacks and whites, but I think for some reason there there ends up being sort of a little like a scene of guys or a clique of guys who are together, and then there's this other clique mm -hmm. playing playing together, and uh, surprise I'm surprised sometimes at how you know, often I'll play in bands that are all white, you know, and it's not, and I, you know, the guys are all, you know, open-minded yeah. people who are not prejudiced, and uh, it's, I think it's a funny thing. I don't really understand it. I feel very fortunate that I grew up in a family that was really not prejudiced and, and put those feelings into me as a kid and, yeah. and uh, you know, brought me up to feel that way. And uh, I, I think it's kind of weird, and it, I don't think, I think a lot of things, there are, there, of course, there are prejudiced people out there of musicians and not musicians, but, uh, you know, and it's always seemed fun to me, funny to me how few 
black people you see at these these jazz parties on the stage and off the stage, you know, because uh, right. especially when it's more towards Dixieland or traditional jazz, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I don't know. I think it just sort of became not the cool thing to do among black peoples. I don't. I don't really understand right. it exactly, but you know, there seems to be very few black musicians playing this. Uh, well, especially Dixieland, mm -hmm. probably down in New Orleans and so forth. But when you go to the um, some of the festivals that have a lot of the Dixieland bands. Um, it's turned more into a, well, it's changed, you know. They mm -hmm. have the costumes and all that, and, and, you know, <laughs> with some of it. And right. Yeah. I, uh, hmm. Yeah, I don't know how to answer that question. I think, well, there's there's been racial issues regarding Winston Marsalis and his groups of guys, and I think, I don't know if he's been misquoted or not, but there was times when people got the impression that he was, he was maybe, uh, Prejudice, but I, I don't think he necessarily is. I, and he's he's since since these things have become hot topics. I think he's made a point of having more white people in his bands and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And and uh, you know, this is just my take on it. I don't know, you know, but it's 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 kind of an icky subject to me. It you know, is, I, I don't it even like to think about. Doesn't have a good it. answer. Yeah, and, and it's uh, probably it could be an answer we don't want to hear too. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. And. Uh, yeah, I think uh, just maybe the term Dixieland probably turned a lot of black people off. You know, the idea of Dixie and the South and the bad connotations of, you know, way back, way down home in Dixie and all that. I, I don't know. Maybe that's part of it. Could be. I don't I didn't know. Think of that. But yeah. uh, <laughs> did you notice in your, as long as we're talking about that, uh, your listening habits? Could you tell a difference between New Orleans? Classic jazz and Chicago. Was there a difference in, in your eyes and your ears? Yeah, I think I, that's a that's a tricky one because these these uh, labels sometimes are misused and misconstrued, and well, labels in general just can cause uh, confusion, you know, as mm -hmm. much as they can clarify. And uh, I think a lot of the music that they call Chicago jazz. Uh, is really New Orleans guys taking their music to Chicago and meeting guys from Chicago and from other places and sort of it changed, it certainly changed some, but you know, is Jelly Roll Morton's music that re he recorded in Chicago, Chicago jazz or New Orleans jazz? I don't know, what do you want to call, you know? Right. And then there's, uh, you hear recordings that were actually made in New Orleans and you know, they, they had a certain flavor to them and uh, you know, there certainly was more more of an emphasis on ensemble playing and less solos. And after Louis Armstrong and Sidney Bechet started uh, making names for themselves as as these brilliant soloists as they were, uh, you know, I think more in Chicago it sort of became more of an more of an emphasis on the solos. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they, there was still an ensemble, you know, going on yeah. a, an emphasis on ensemble, but there'd be a lot more solos. I'd say if there's really one difference, that would be the major, major difference, you yeah. know. But uh, it's it's a little blurred, you know, because a lot of those guys were were patting, patterning themselves after New Orleans musicians and New Orleans bands, but they'd sort of come up with their own way of doing it, you mm -hmm. know. So <laughs> tough. It seems like every time you make a statement about jazz, you have to say, but yeah. Then there was this, and right. you know, it it's it's a music that has moved through so many things so fast. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. And you, you seem to have listened to almost all of them. Well, I've tried to do my homework, yeah. you know. <laughs> it's all interesting to me. So I have a zillion 78s and mm -hmm. records and uh -huh. CDs at home. And <laughs> well, if we were to do an interview every 10 years, um, you have any career goals in mind that, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years from now we'd be talking about the fact that you have done what? Well, uh, I'm pretty happy with the way things are going. I've already gotten to do two albums of my own, and I've played with some of my heroes. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's not that I've done it all yet, or I don't mean that, but I'd, I'd like to continue to, uh, to to do more work as a leader, perhaps, and do more albums as a leader, as mm -hmm. well as playing with more of my heroes and just making great music, the greatest music I can, and uh, trying to put music out there that people want to hear and, and maybe 
come up more and more with some of my own ideas and ways of playing it that, you know, increase, increasingly have my own voice, basically, you uh -huh. know, and, and uh, wouldn't, wouldn't mind making a little bit of money along the way, too, but... Uh, <laughs> I can handle that. I know people don't like to think about musicians thinking about that, but I wouldn't mind having a little bit more yeah. money to make. That don't you just way. do it for the love of it? <laughs> well, mostly, yeah. Mostly. <laughs> yeah, or else yeah. I would have maybe been a stockbroker or something if I, <laughs> if I was really concerned about making money. <laughs> you had an awful lot of good advice and guidance. In, uh, would you have anything to say to uh, a young trumpet player who might not have the kind of... Uh, foundation that you had that but was still aspiring to a career in jazz I yeah feel like ending with an easy question no that's that's a good one it's something i've put some thought into uh -huh. having i've had some students you know yeah. occasionally have private students so it's something i've thought about and uh i think if you you know for a young aspiring jazz trumpet player uh, of course you got to listen to some of the great records and do your homework as i said you know go back and listen to Louis Armstrong and, and, you know, listen to the greats throughout history and, uh, you know, put it together in your own way, you know. And also, to, I think one of the most important things that a lot of young musicians don't really catch on to is they just need to get out and play as much as possible with groups. Because there's guys who go through high school and college and most of their playing is done with their J Jamie Abersold play along records, which can be a useful tool to practice with, but they're not used to playing with other musicians. Mm -hmm. And they don't, they go out and play a gig and they might as well be playing along with a record. They're not interacting, which is one of the big joys and important things in jazz that some people overlook or forget about. That it's really supposed to be about this magical kind of interaction where you're listening to him and you you pick up a little thing that he did and he bounces off of you and and this guy's playing harmony and you know it's it's you know and you just you can't really learn to do that otherwise you know from just doing it you just have to get out and play with guys and play with the best guys you can and uh, go out and listen to live music and and pay attention to what's going on on stage and notice all this stuff and uh, I think those are some of the most important things. And it, it helps to practice too. <laughs> yeah. Learn the foundations of your instrument. You know, mm -hmm. you really, you know, I, I'm, I feel very fortunate. I had a good, good background as far as good private teachers and, uh, you know, a bit of a classical background. So I was studying that at the same time I was studying jazz, really listening to the records and learning solos off of records, trying to get inside the the heads of these greats, you know, and, and sort of yeah. learn a solo and analyze how the how do these notes that he played relate to the melody and relate to the chord structure, and uh, you know, just try and figure out what what was he thinking. You know, you have to just sort of try and get into their heads, and then not necessarily end up being a copy of them, but learning from you can learn from even the deceased great jazz mm -hmm. people and get a private lesson from them in a way by doing that. You know, when you're improvising, are you thinking? about the chords that are going by just i mean that's a good question yeah um i think it sort of depends on how well i know the song sometimes <laughs> you know when i when i'm improvising on a song that i'm familiar with i'm not really thinking about the chords because they're just sort of i know them i understand how the song is put together with how the chords fit together and uh i'm thinking more about well, really, I guess the best answer is when you're really improvising, you're not really thinking <laughs> in a way. It's like it's more of like a Zen kind of thing, really. It's more like you just sort of you've learned, you've done your your preparation, you know the songs, and you're just sort of in the moment. You know what I mean? You're listening oh. to what's going around around you, and and you're thinking maybe about the melody, or maybe you're thinking about what the guy. The previous solo, what he ended with, you might just start with that idea and elaborate on that, or uh, try. You're basically just constructing a new melody. I try to think more melodically than chordally in mm -hmm. my solos, and just think of you know making a melodic line, you know. But there's times when I don't know a song very well, which might very well happen here. It always mm -hmm. does, but uh, where. You're really listening hard to the chords and the bass, you know, to, to hear how the harmony ties together. So you're really listening to that and just trying to lock into that. And then 
trying to jump to that other stage like you like you know the song, you know, <laughs> without you know forgetting what you have to yeah. listen to what's going on around yeah. you. You might not know what's coming ahead, you know, and you have to really just react quickly. You have to have really quick ears and quick reflexes sometimes, and just respond that way. Oh, a very good description. And you hope that the bass player and the piano player know the tune. <laughs> that can be a real problem. I've had those gigs where, you know, there's the blind leading the blind, uh -huh. and it can really be, can be a disaster. Right. But, you know, hopefully you have a leader who's going to be smart enough to know, you know, what's, what's right. safe, <laughs> right. what would make sense, you know, as far as songs that will come off. Right. Doesn't always happen, but, <laughs> of course, we always take risks in, in jazz, you yeah. know, that's part of sure. it. And, you, you know, there's a lot of times when at least somebody in the group doesn't know the song as well as he'd like to. But like I said, you, you hopefully you develop your ears enough so that you, you have these fast reflexes yeah. and you can respond to that. I think there's a certain amount of trying to make the audience think you know the song, even though mm -hmm. that you're oh, sure. not. Yeah, maybe yeah you never, I know the song, sure. Well, you never know. Sometimes <laughs> the, 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 the comments you get, people say, oh, that was really, really great, and you're feeling like, whoa. You know, yeah, you, I didn't really know what I was doing. You're wiping there. the sweat off. Like, <laughs> I guess I pulled that off. I don't yeah. know. You know, right. yeah. Sometimes you feel like it might have been horrible because of the feelings going in, inside mm -hmm. you. Like you were just, like, barely holding on. When you know, if you're professional, a lot of times you can you can yeah. play it off. Right. <laughs> it happens. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, I've really enjoyed talking to you, and I I wish you the best in your your career and. We'll do this again a few years from now, maybe. Sounds and, uh, good to me. I enjoyed see what's, it. What's going on? I enjoyed talking to you too. You had great questions. Right. Well, on behalf of Hamilton College, I'd like to thank John Eric Kelso for being with us, and hope you have a great uh, gig. And no one calls too many tunes that you don't know. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Good luck to you. <laughs>